<clears throat> Thanks very much. Well, I, I hope to provide a little light entertainment for, for lunch in, in the form of uh, uh, my, my stand-up tragedy routine. Um, but I, I, I want to start by just telling you a little bit about where I, I come from. Uh, I read this book in 1972 when it was published, uh, The Limits to Growth, and it changed my life. I w uh, as, as a young person, I took for granted that the, the world that I had grown up in was one that, that would persist in some recognizable form far in, into the future. And this book challenged that idea. It was my dawning awareness, if you will, that how we are living is is fundament fundamentally unsustainable and that, that there would be uh, discontinuities and disruptions inevitably to this way of life it, as long as we persisted in it. Um, now, of course, this book was very controversial when it, when it was published. It was, of course, a, a, a computer modeling scenario study. It wasn't an effort to forecast the future per se, but rather to come up with a series of models or scenarios depicting uh, what would likely happen across a series of variables uh, under certain conditions. Now, the standard run scenario was, was the sort of business as usual scenario and, and the most pessimistic, uh, forecasting a a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first half of, of the 21st century. Obviously, this was a, a, a very unwelcome outcome, and the, the, the study and the book were, were de widely derided, uh, especially by mainstream economists. Um, take a look at these graphs, and you can see why. It, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, and uh, this, this is the updated version of the standard run scenario uh, published just uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, now, the, the criticisms that were leveled against the, the limits to growth uh, study were, uh, were, were harsh indeed, and, and many people who hear of limits to growth today believe that it, it was long ago debunked. However, the, the uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia did a retrospective analysis of the original 1972 limits to growth study uh, just a few years ago and concluded that it was the standard run scenario, the most pessimistic of the scenarios, which turned out to be most robust in terms of accurately modeling uh, the evolution of the, the, the various variables uh, in the years uh, since then. So I guess the good news is we're right on track. <laughs> so wh what, what is likely to limit uh, economic growth over the course of this century? And, and uh, many of us have, believe this is a foregone conclusion that you can't grow an economy forever in a finite system. So it's only a, a question of, of when and, and why uh, we will see limits to growth. Um, <clears throat> my conclusion, and that of my colleagues at Post Carbon Institute, is that uh, energy is the, is the most likely limiting factor in a couple of ways. Uh, now, energy, of course, is the most important factor in the economy. If the lights go out or the gasoline pumps run dry, the economy doesn't diminish by 10% because we spend 10% of GDP on, on energy. Therefore, you know, if energy goes away, then we lose 10% of GDP. No, the, the economy goes away without energy. Uh, the, the, uh, the economy is energy. And of course, we've, we've used energy forever. Energy is essential to existence itself. But up until very recent times, it was almost all in, in renewable forms. Uh, biomass and, and muscle power. That all changed with the Industrial Revolution, which we really should think of as, as the fossil fuel revolution, because we, we had never had sources of energy previously that were so, uh, so potent and so cheap. Think about it this way, and I'm, I'm, since I'm from California, I'll use uh, US metrics. When was the last time you ran out of 
gas in your car and had to push it a few feet off to the side of the road. Uh, if, if, if you think back to that occasion, you'll remember that was, that was a lot of hard work. Well, imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. How much work would that be? Well, depends on the size of the car and, and how strong you are and so on, but a, a reasonable estimate is six or eight weeks of hard labor. Now, of course, we get that done for us, having our cars push 20 or 30 miles by a single U.S. gallon of gasoline for which we, we in California are paying less than $4. So six or eight weeks of en the energy equivalence of human labor for $4, that's incredibly cheap energy and that's what has enabled us and encouraged us in fact to mechanize virtually every aspect of the economy that we possibly could. And that yielded extraordinary economic expansion, completely unheard of in all of previous human history. Really, when we talk about economic growth, we're talking about what's happened since the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that time, uh, empires rose and fell, but daily life for most people was pretty much the same from century to century, from millennium to millennium. Uh, hewing wood, drawing water, and uh, growing crops. But uh, then with the 20th century especially, all hell breaks loose. Uh, close correlation, not an exact correlation, but a very close correlation between energy consumption and GDP growth. And of course, carbon emissions. As long as all of this is based upon the extraction and uh, burning of fossil fuels, the result is climate change. So if climate change is in fact a, a serious problem, and I'll argue that it, it really, really is, then just in, from this standpoint alone, fossil fueled industrialism is, is, is a self-limiting phenomenon. Uh, we've, we've pretty much accepted two degrees of, of total warming. I mean, that's, that's what our policies are geared to at this point. But even at the one degree of warming that we've already observed, uh, we're seeing, obviously, severe weather events, including droughts and so on. And these severe weather events impact uh, food production, agriculture, which then impacts economies and, and people's lives. Uh, I, I won't alarm you unduly with all of, all of the things that we've already seen over the past, the events we've already seen over the past few years, but alarm is warranted because what, we're, what is happening is we're setting off self-reinforcing feedbacks within uh, the environment that have not been uh, uh, allowed for in the IPC scenarios that have largely guided government policy around uh, climate change. One of these self-reinforcing feedbacks has to do with the, the melting of, of methane-bearing permafrost in, in northern regions of places like Canada and Siberia. Uh, and as methane is released into the atmosphere, of course, it's a much more powerful, potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So that speeds up warming, which, which melts more methane, which speeds up warming further, and so on. The same thing with the melting of the polar ice. The polar ice reflects sunlight back into space. So as the northern ice cap uh, melts and recedes, there's less of that reflectivity, and the, uh, the Arctic Ocean absorbs more heat. Uh, and the, it's the oceans that are absorbing by far the majority of, of the increased heat from uh, global warming. Uh, over 90% is going into the oceans, and less than 10% is going into the atmosphere. Uh, so we're seeing impacts to the oceans, not, not only from the, the heating of the oceans and the expansion of the oceans, but also the absorption by the oceans of carbon dioxide producing uh, carbonic acid and acidifying the oceans uh, and it, uh, 
according to many oceanographers that I've spoken to, per potentially leading to the death of the oceans within this, this century. It's a rather uh, stark thing to, to contemplate. So really, even though we've, we've accepted the idea of two degrees, and even though one degree of warming so far has already led to unacceptable levels of, of impacts, we may be, with these, with these feedbacks that haven't been largely taken into account, we may be looking at warming of up to four or, or six degrees, which would really be off the charts, taking us into unknown territory. Uh, human civilization has never existed in that kind of climate, and it's unlikely that, that it could, particularly in, in, the, in the transitional period, which is the most, uh, <laughs> the most, of most interest to us. Um, why the transitional period? Because it's, it's likely to be uh, 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 extremely unstable. Uh, we're, we're, we're not moving from one stable condition to another stable condition immediately. The, the transitional period will, be, will, be, will feature uh, extreme instability. Okay, so from that standpoint, fossil fuels are a, a, a sort of self-limiting exercise in terms of, of producing economic growth, but they, they are as well in another way because we uh, we, we know that fossil fuels are finite by definition. These are non-renewable resources. So when we talk about developing our fossil fuel resources, what we really mean is liquidating our fossil fuel resources. And we've generally been doing that as fast as we possibly can. And we do it according to the best first or low-hanging fruit principle. So generally speaking, maybe it's not true in every single instance, but generally speaking, we went after the, the best coal seams first. In, in the 19th century, the coal seams that were thickest and closest to the surface and the highest quality, the anthracite and so on. Uh, and, and then we, we left the, the nasty, uh, thin seams that were deeply buried of lower quality coal, the lignite and so on. We left those for later. Uh, the same thing with oil and natural gas. And this is a, an extremely useful diagram that um, it, it applies to all non-renewable resources, but, but I'm going to talk about it particularly in relation to oil and gas. Uh, it's certainly true that we will never run out of oil or gas or, or any non-renewable resource. But we, uh, we, we've started at the top of the pyramid and we're digging our way down or drilling our way down. And um, a as you go further down the pyramid, the, the larger the resource base, ironically enough, but the more effort you have to expend in, in extracting it. This seems to have real-world consequences in, in, in terms of oil. We're already seeing the, the, the consequences of uh, this law of diminishing returns, if you will, on resource extraction. Uh, up until 2005, world oil production was growing at a relatively constant rate with a, a bit of a hiccup in the 1970s and early 1980s as a result of political events having to do with OPEC, all of that's famous history, I don't need to rehearse it. But since 2005, world oil production hasn't grown at the historic rate. What's going on here? At the same time, oil prices have increased quite, quite dramatically. And these oil price increases were not forecast uh, by the US Department of Energy or the International Energy Agency or uh, uh, virtually anyone else except for a few rogue analysts who, who, uh, mostly, who, who were mostly petroleum geologists and widely disregarded as, as peak oil conspiracy theorists. Uh, <clears throat> this is what's been happening in the, in the last few years from the standpoint of returns on investment in exploration and production. From 1998 to 2005, 
One and a half trillion dollars of investment in ENP yielded 6.8 million barrels a day in added production. But from 2005 to 2013, four trillion yielded only three million barrels a day in added production. So you can see, it, it, just in stark monetary terms, this decline in returns on investment. Now, interestingly enough, of the four trillion invested, about 350 billion were spent on unconventionals in North America. And we're talking here about tight oil in the, the back and play in North Dakota and the Eagle Ford play in, in South Texas and a few others and uh, Canadian tar sands or oil sands. And virtually all net new production came from those sources. If you take out the growth in tar sands and growth in tight oil production in the US, the rest of world oil pr production would be flat to declining since 2005. So we spent, or the industry spent, over three and a half trillion dollars to keep global oil production steady to slightly declining since 2005. Uh, this shows up also in the financials of the oil companies themselves. This is a, a graphic from Wall Street Journal from uh, a couple of weeks ago, showing ExxonMobil, Royal Dutch Shell, and Chevron, uh, how much their capex or capital expenditure has grown in uh, recent years, and yet how their, their actual production has, has pretty much withered at the same time. Now, if it's all up to the unconventionals, then what are, what are we looking at? The, the claims that are being made for the unconventionals are really extraordinary. And, and here, I'm focusing largely on the, uh, the, the, the tight oil plays of, of the US and the, uh, and the shale gas plays. The claims are that the US has 100 years, I've even heard up to 200 years of uh, resource in terms of shale gas, that the US is about to become Saudi America, the world's largest oil producer for decades to come. Uh, <clears throat> on what are those claims based? Well, they're largely based on uh, surveys of the plays themselves, how, how much resource is there, and then the assumption that the the first wells are typical of how wells are going to perform throughout those plays and that all of those plays will be equally productive. We decided at uh, Post Carbon Institute to test those assumptions. So we undertook a study and the study was, uh, was headed up by uh, David Hughes, who's a Canadian geoscientist, uh, spent his career with the Canadian Geological Survey we purchased the rights to the data on over 63,000 currently producing shale gas and, and tight oil wells. We looked at the location of each well, the initial production rate and production rate over time. What we found is that uh, the, the assumptions are not confirmed, that there's wide variability in productivity between the plays and within the plays. Within each of these uh, currently producing plays, there is uh, typically a small core area or sweet spot that is highly productive uh, and uh, profitable. But outside of those small core areas, produ initial production rates are lower and production decline rates are savage. Uh, the overall decline curve, for example, in uh, the Haynesville play for shale gas, um, about a 68% decline in production in the first year. So that means drillers, in order to maintain and grow production, have to drill and drill and drill. There's a kind of treadmill uh, operation that's required just to maintain productivity. But of course, if these core areas are relatively restricted in size, there aren't infinite numbers of places to drill. <clears throat> uh, this is another uh, way of, of, of seeing what's happening in terms of uh, natural gas in the U.S. And of course, nat U.S. natural gas production, which was declining in the, the early 2000s, 
has hit record highs in recent years. So this is a, a big success story for shale gas in the US. We've heard it referred to as the shale revolution. But uh, as we can see here, the number of wells has increased dramatically and the productivity per well has actually declined substantially as more and more of US production comes from unconventional shale gas wells. Uh, now, of the, of the shale gas plays, all are already currently in decline, except for one, which is the Marcellus in uh, Pennsylvania. It was the last to be uh, developed. Uh, the first to be developed, the Barnett Shale, underlies, among other places, the city of Fort Worth, Texas. And, uh, and as, as you can see here, the city of Fort Worth has uh, seen e uh, increasing rates of drilling, but declining revenues from that drilling. This is pretty easy to track because it's in, it's in the city records. Uh, why would that be? Because the drillers are now being forced to move outside the sweet spots into the peripheral areas that are simply less productive and where decline rates are, are so much higher. So why is the US talking about exporting natural gas? Well, it's, it's not because the US is, is, uh, has a surplus of gas in a true sense. The US is still a net natural gas importer. What's going on is that the, the price of natural gas was driven down by producers drilling too much too fast, in or, partly in order to keep the value of their leases high. They had to justify those leases. If once, you, once you sign the lease, you have to drill within a certain amount of time. And there was a leasing frenzy that occurred uh, over the past uh, six or seven years throughout these, these geographic areas. And many of the, of the companies now, the dry gas producing companies especially, are losing money on every cubic foot of natural gas produced. So how do they stay in business? Through sales of leases. This is certainly true of, for, for example, of Chesapeake, which is the largest of the shale gas producers, hasn't turned a profit on production in any one of the last 10 years, but remains a profitable company largely through sales of uh, drilling leases. So how do you sell a drilling lease? You have to maintain the perception of value in that lease. So public relations is extremely important in the shale gas world. Keeping the perception alive that this is a game changer, that there's a hundred years worth of the stuff or more, and that it's a manufacturing operation. You can drill anywhere within these plays and come up with a profitable well. Uh, same thing essentially is happening in the, uh, the world of tight oil and the Bakken in uh, North Dakota and the Eagle Ford in South Texas. Uh, small sweet spots, high decline curves. Um, now the overall annual production decline in the Bakken is 40%. So that's taking into account that the older wells are declining at a slower pace. They're producing less oil, but their, their decline r rate has has gone more horizontal. So if you take all of the wells together, the overall production rate decline is about 40%. So that's how much the industry has to make up each year before production can increase. Uh, clearly that can go on for a while. It's been going on for several years, but for how long? Uh, Again, we did the analysis, and this is our forecast, based on the drilling data from the industry itself. Uh, we see a peak in Eagle Ford and Bakken production uh, in 2016, and a rapid decline thereafter. So this is not a resource that we can count on over the long term. Uh, similar situation with, uh, with shale gas. Meanwhile, in the oil world, we've gotten used to these, these very high prices. And those high prices have an impact. Uh, American drivers are driving less. And this is the first time this has happened in US history. Vehicle miles driven have declined substantially. 
people are buying more fuel efficient cars. They're buying fuel, fewer cars. Their cars are, are, are uh, lasting longer. Um, and all of, all of this is, is a part of an economy of demand destruction. As the oil price rises, it destroys a certain amount of demand. And that demand destruction takes the form of efficiency, but it also takes the form of a, simply a declining economy. It makes it harder for the economy to grow as energy becomes more expensive. And it, particularly in the case of oil, because oil is not only the, the number one energy source in the US, but it's also virtually all of transport energy. And transportation is key to trade and therefore to economic activity in general. Oil is really the linchpin of the economy, more so than any other single energy source. Uh, the oil sands or tar sands of Canada, of course, uh, are also an unconventional source of oil that has been growing in recent years. Uh, and the size of the resource base is, uh, is extremely large, no question about that. But the energy returned on energy in, invested in producing fuel from the tar sands is very low. Now, historically, uh, the, well, if, if, let's, let's be really historical and go back to pre-fossil fuel times. The energy returned on energy production in agriculture and, and uh, animal husbandry and all the ways we had of producing energy back in in agrarian times was, was quite low. This was part of the magic of the fossil fuel revolution. It took only a few thousand dollars in the early days. Go, go back and watch the movie Boomtown with Clark Gable about the early days of, of the oil industry. Investing a few thousand dollars in, in equipment and drilling leases and you could become a millionaire overnight. The energy returned on energy invested was on average a hundred to one or better. That's declined substantially over the past uh, uh, years, uh, especially the last three or four decades, but especially the past few years in, in North America. For the tar sands, the average energy returned on energy invested is about five to one. Now, if, that's, if that were financial returns on investment, that would be pretty good. Um, but in, in, in terms of energy, everything we do uses energy, whether it's healthcare or education or manufacturing and on and on. All of those things use energy, but they don't produce any energy. So the energy that we invest in energy production, that's special. That has to be extremely productive to finance, in energy terms, all the other things we do in industrial societies, maintaining a middle class with you know, a blinding array of different occupations and specialties. Um, I'll get back to that in just a moment, but before we leave the tar sands, I just want to finish by reminding us all of the resource pyramid. The tar sands that are being mined today are the very best tar sands that will ever be mined. Because once again, it's the low-hanging fruit principle. Yes, there's a large resource base there, but, but it's, it's yet another example of the resource pyramid. Um, okay, back to energy return on, inv on energy invested. For the US, we've gotten down to about 10 to one uh, average energy return on energy invested. Globally, uh, roughly 15 to 18 to one. These are moving numbers and they're rapidly moving in in the wrong way, <laughs> if if economic growth is the is the uh, is the goal. Now, obviously, the solution to both of these problems, climate and energy quality or energy supply, is to transition away to other energy sources that are clean and yet economic. Uh, that's easier said than done, as I'm sure all of you understand. There are, uh, there are limits and problems with all of the energy sources that are available to us. 
Uh, and if we, if we had many decades to gradually and incrementally solve this problem, uh, that, that, would, that would be a good thing because it's, it's certainly going to take us decades and we don't have silver bullets just waiting on the shelf ready to be deployed to give us all the energy that fossil fuels are currently giving us but with no, uh, no costs or environmental problems or uh, uh, problems with intermittency or anyth anything of that nature. But, but the, the transition is not optional, and it's being thrust upon us by events. So we're, we're going to have to accept some trade-off in terms of energy quality and quantity in order to maintain industrial society as best we can during this century when really many of the most cherished, cherished aspects of our modern industrial fossil fuel way of life are, are going to be challenged profoundly. So as we transition to renewables, for example, with intermittency, we may need to uh, find ways to regulate demand around supply rather than up, up to this point with dispatchable energy sources, we have, we have dispatched energy to meet demand. Well, we may, to, may need to rethink that. Find ways to help people use energy when it's available and not use it when it isn't. Uh, in addition to changing our energy sources, we're also going to have to think very deeply about how we use energy. Uh, we've gotten used to using energy in forms and at rates that are probably unsustainable. N never mind growth in energy consumption. We're talking here just about maintaining current rates of energy consumption. So transportation is really key in all of this, again, because it represents all of transport and, and trade, and therefore it's a linchpin to the economy. The assumption is, I think, on many people's parts that, that we will simply transition our current fleets of gasoline-powered vehicles to running on solar electricity or, or something of that sort. But the fact is that automobiles are inherently energy inefficient, regardless of what we run them on. So if, if we want to be serious about energy efficiency and transportation, then we have to think about getting away from the automobile. Now, there aren't any really good substitutes on the shelf for air transport. Uh, the airline industry is, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but more or less doomed over the long run. It's going to go away. Yes, some sophisticated biofuels could be developed, but they'd be very expensive. Hydrogen-powered planes, possibly on the drawing board, but it, realistically within our lifetimes, what we're more, much more likely to see is a, is a slow contraction of the airline industry around core customers who can afford to pay a lot to get from place to place. Meanwhile, necessary transportation, uh, ground transportation, has to uh, be minimized by redesigning our cities so that people don't have to get into motorized transport in order to get to where they work or, or shop. And then providing what motorized transport we need through the most efficient sources, which tend to be public transportation of various kinds, and then encouraging bicycling and walking wherever possible, making it safe and enjoyable for people to walk and bicycle. Also with our buildings, there, was, there, there were some very good presentations and comments this morning about uh, building efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency and how drastically that could be improved. Uh, I'm sure many of you are, are well aware of the passive house movement in Germany, over 20,000 structures already built with virtually zero energy inputs, uh, even in a, in, in a cold climate. 
in, the, in the US, I, I believe it's only a few dozen of these structures have been built as opposed to 20,000 in, in Germany. I'm not sure of the number in Canada. Uh, <clears throat> but clearly retrofitting existing buildings and changing building standards uh, for, for future construction is an extremely important part of this, this whole uh, transitional period. And then the, the food system. Uh, some of our most crucial uses of energy are in our food system, growing food and transporting food. Uh, we, but we have created a food system that is overwhelmingly dependent again on fossil fuels, primarily oil and natural gas. Natural gas for fertilizer, oil for transportation, other chemicals, and for fueling farm equipment. So taking oil out of the food system is extremely important. Localizing food systems, uh, experimentation with organic agriculture has been going on for decades now, and there are uh, excellent um, trials and systems and examples uh, all around the world showing that food can be grown as intensively in ecological, using ecological methods as using chemical dependent methods. But some of these things actually add up to a plus if we start to think differently. If our assumption is that the future looks like the 1960s and the Jetsons, only more so, then I think we're going to be very disappointed. But does that way of life actually make us that much happier? Uh, there is a, a whole field now of happiness studies in psychology looking at self-reported levels of satisfaction with life, and it turns out that uh, sitting in traffic jams does not make us happy. Uh, and, and in fact, it, it turns out that higher levels of consumption don't necessarily make us happy. Uh, certainly, if people don't have enough energy to stay warm at night, if they don't have enough food to eat, then they're not going to be particularly happy. But once basic needs are met, there's a pretty shaky correlation between levels of satisfaction and rates of, of consumption. It turns out that we built this consumer society over the course of an anomalous period of time, the, 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 the tw mostly the 20th century, when uh, <clears throat> we saw that it was possible to grow the economy and there was a lot of money to be made doing so. And so we built institutions that depend upon constant economic growth. Governmental institutions that require constantly increasing tax revenues in order to fund uh, government services to the population. Just, just one example. But an ever increasing economy simply may not be in the cards for us. If in fact those limits to growth scenario studies from the, from the 1970s were correct, we may be looking at a century of economic contraction. That could be very bad news, or it could be mildly bad and partially positive news, depending on how we handle it, whether we, whether we plan for it or simply let ourselves hit the wall. Um, <clears throat> certainly there are, it, we, we speak often of things like peak oil or peak phosphorus, depleting non-renewable resources, but there are plenty of things that are renewable and that aren't at peak. And if we concentrate more on those, less on GDP and more on quality of life, there's every reason to think that we could make this transition during the course of the 20th century in a, a peaceful and, and healthful and satisfactory way. I don't think that's at all a given. Uh, quite frankly, I think the way we're going right now is leading us toward conflict over depleting resources, and it's leading us toward uh, economies that will go through uh, boom and bust cycles in which each boom is smaller and each bust is, is deeper. Uh, 
hopefully it won't take us too long to recognize that pattern, but it's already very late in the day, both from the standpoint of the climate and from the standpoint of, of fossil fuel resource quality, especially when it comes to oil and natural gas. So I hope I haven't depressed you too much, but uh, this is the world the way uh, I, I see it and my organization sees it, and we, we do try to provide on our website, resilience.org, we try to provide daily updated, we do provide daily updated information to help individuals and households and communities find ways to adapt to this new economic reality in ways that are not only sensible and economic, but also enjoyable and fun and artistic. So I hope the same to you. Thank you.